Welcome back to the Drunk on Riding Stephen King Dissection Series. Today, we're talking the 1981 release Cujo, and its 1983 adaptation of the same name, starring Dee Wallace, Daniel Hugh Kelly, and Danny Pintoro. As usual, we will dig into the formation and writing of the book and its film, go over the plot details, and then give myself a minute or so of reflection. But before we do all of that, I just want to say that this episode is brought to you in part through the patronage of Aria North. If you too would like to become part of the show, part of the series, and help uh, the series continue, please head on over to drunkonwriting.com. Now, where was I? There's something different about Cujo that you notice right off the bat. There are no chapter breaks. There are no section breaks. There are no page breaks. Well, except for one, the one that starts the book off right at the beginning, where we get other than just a blank page, we get the words once upon a time, which we will come back to. But this sort of direction for the book, it works because the book never stops. You know, obviously, until it does and, you know, it has its ending and, yeah, every book stops. But you know what I mean. It never stops. And that seems so fitting given the subject matter, this this monstrous dog that just is relentlessly attacking. And to be honest, this sort of nonstop narrative, it kept me reading at times when I really didn't feel like reading because I didn't really totally enjoy Cujo, especially in parts. And as a matter of fact, I would put it as one of the weaker King novels up to this point. And there might be a reason for that. Just listen to this quote from Stephen King's nonfiction book on writing. There's one novel, Cujo, that I barely remember writing at all. I don't say that with pride or shame, only with a vague sense of sorrow and loss. I like that book. I wish I could remember enjoying the good parts as I put them down on the page. King wrote this while on a cocaine binge. From what I understand, the constant pressure of deadlines, of delivering these top-notch quality blockbuster books, these bestsellers, these New York Times bestsellers, trying to outdo himself one after the other, it started to take its toll. And the addiction that Stephen King previously touched on in The Shining, well, it sort of got worse. And it's possible that Cujo also touches on the concept of addiction. In fact, it's, it's probably likely but we will touch upon that a bit later. For now, let's talk what we know is fact. The name Cujo was based on the media's misspelled version of the name adopted by William Wolfe, aka Willie Wolfe, one of the men responsible for kidnapping Patty Hearst and indoctrinating her into the Symbionese Liberation Army. You might recall that The Stand also sort of dealt with this same situation. And it's actually mentioned within Cujo that this name may bear resemblance or at least have its origin in the SLA. Just listen to this quote from Cujo. Cujo was the same name William Wolfe of the SLA had taken. Although Donna found it impossible to believe that Joe Camber had named his St. Bernard after a radical robber of banks and kidnapper of rich young heiresses. She doubted if Joe Camber had ever heard of the Symbionese Liberation Army. Interestingly, Another dog within the narrative toward the end of the book actually goes by Willie for narrative reasons unknown, as was Cujo. And the book's plot was also inspired by a series of real-life events, one that King went over extensively within this interview with the Paris Review. Now, I'm going to quote extensively from this review right now, but I really suggest you give it a read. I'll include the link below. Go give it a read because there's a whole lot more in that interview. But when speaking with the Paris Review, King said this about the formation of Cujo. I was having trouble with my motorcycle, and I heard about a place I could get it fixed. We we're living in Bridgeton, Maine, which is a resort-type town, a lake community in the western part of the state. But over in the northern part of Bridgeton, it's really rough country. There are a lot of farmers just making their own way in the old style. The mechanic had a farmhouse and an auto shop across the yard. So I took my motorcycle up there, and when I got into the yard, it quit entirely. And the biggest St. Bernard I ever saw in my life came out of that garage, and it came toward me. 
Those dogs looked horrible anyway, particularly in summer. They've got the dewlaps and they've got the runny eyes. They don't look like they're well. He started growling at me, way down in his throat. Urgh. At that time, I weighed about 220 pounds, so I outweighed the dog by maybe 10 pounds. The mechanic came out of the garage and said to me, Oh, that's Bowser, or whatever the dog's name was. It wasn't Cujo. He said, Don't worry about him, he does that to everybody. So I put my hand out to the dog, and the dog went for my hand. The guy had one of those socket wrenches in his hand, and he brought it down on the dog's hindquarters, a steel wrench. It sounded like a rug beater hitting a rug. The dog just yelped once and sat down. And the guy said something to me like, Bowser usually doesn't do this. He must not have liked your face. Right away, it's my fault. I remember how scared I was because there was no place to hide. I was on my bike, but it was dead, and I couldn't outrun him. If the man wasn't there with the wrench and the dog decided to attack, oh. But that was not a story. It was just a piece of something. A couple of weeks later, I was thinking about this Ford Pinto that my wife and I had. It was the first new car we ever owned. We bought it with a double day advance for carry, $2,500. We had problems with it right away because there was something wrong with the needle valve in the carburetor. It would stick, the carburetor would flood, and the car wouldn't start. I was worried about my wife getting stuck in that Pinto, and I thought, what if she took that car to get fixed like I did my motorcycle, and the needle valve stuck and she couldn't get it going? But instead of the dog just being a mean dog, what if the dog was really crazy? There's a lot to unpack there in, the, in that incredibly long quote. Again, I apologize for how long it is, but it all seemed very relevant to this dissection. But it's kind of funny, right? How this one little event, this one little seemingly innocuous thing could start the ball rolling and turn it into this novel, right? This story. It's pretty cool how that happens. But before we actually get to that story and we start digging into the plot details of that, there are two other things that I would like to note. One, Stephen King originally considered Cujo a Richard Bachman novel, and I think, from what I understand, that changed when the more supernatural uh, developments started really getting into the book, and probably when they started really being expanded upon. Those supernatural elements, the parts of Cujo that act as a direct sequel to The Dead Zone, which is not something I was expecting in any way, shape, or form when I first sat down to read this book. But it's something we are clued into from the very start. It is on the very first page, picking up right where that once upon a time left off. See, I told you we'd come back to it. But here, let me quote this, this very beginning of Cujo. Once upon a time, not so long ago, a monster came to the small town of Castle Rock, Maine. He was not werewolf, vampire, ghoul, or unnameable creature from the enchanted forest or from the snowy wastes. He was only a cop named Frank Dodd with mental and sexual problems. A good man named John Smith uncovered his name by a kind of magic, but before he could be captured, perhaps it was just as well, Frank Dodd killed himself. And that subplot continues to rear its ugly head throughout the book, throughout the plot. Which, let's just talk about the plot right now because there is a lot more to Cujo than just a rabid dog. There are actually six simultaneous stories, and probably a bit more than that when you start adding in all the other characters and subplots that are introduced for a page or two. Six primary plots that all kind of interweave and interconnect to tell the full story of Cujo the novel. It's not just this one rabid dog. What are those six? Well, I'm going to list them out for you right now. One, two men, Vic and Roger, trying to save their ad agency after a food dye accident screws their number one client over. Two, Donna, Vic's wife, having an ending an affair with a local somewhat crazed handyman, Steve Kemp, who tries for revenge. A closet monster who we're told is Frank Dodd inhabiting Vic and Donna's son Tad's room. The disintegration of another family, the Camber family, particularly the wife Charity trying to give her son Brett a better life than her drunkard husband Joe sees for him. The titular Cujo, who Joe Camber had taken in lieu of payment for a job he'd done for a one-eyed fellow named Ray Crowell, an interesting little tidbit, his fall from grace, and the failing aforementioned Pinto, which has a needle valve stuck. Now, I have no idea 
what a needle valve is. I don't know if that's a remnant from old cars. I don't know if it's in current cars or whatever, but apparently it's rather important. And it is especially important in this novel because for all intents and purposes, the needle valve is the reason that Tad dies at the end. No, no, wait, no, let me take that back. Vic is the reason that Tad dies at the end because he doesn't get the needle valve fixed before he leaves to, to get the, to, to fix the, so, so wait, wait, then maybe, maybe the serial is the reason that Tad dies at the end. And if you take that line of thought, maybe it's the dye manufacturer who is responsible for Tad's death at the end. Of course, if anyone had mentioned to Joe Kamer that the dog was going rabid, maybe that also would have saved Tad before the end of the book. What I'm getting at here is that here in Cujo, it's sort of this Rue Goldberg of a novel, this Rue Goldberg of just events that take place or do not take place that all seemingly feed into each other to ensure that the kid, Tad, this little four-year-old innocent kid, dies at the end of the book. Just look at all the ways that Tad could have been saved, that Donna could have been saved from all this anguish and grief. Just just off the bat here, the couple things that I have written down. The guys who delivered the chain fall could have not forgotten to give Joe Camber a call to mention Cujo going bad. Charity could have not prevented her son, Brett, from mentioning Cujo being sick to his father. Kemp could have not erased the note saying Don had gone to Camber's or could have mentioned it to the police later instead of playing innocent like the little screwball he is. Or Vic could have not focused primarily on Kemp as a suspect and thought back in his little previous week to when Donna and Tad were going to bring the car to Camber's to get the needle valve fixed. And so on and so forth. Frankly, there are tons of ways that Tad could have been saved. Peppered throughout this whole novel, they're just little tiny things. Just somebody making a phone call at the right time could have saved Tad, could have kept Donna from getting mauled, from getting stuck there for three days and withering under the hot sun. All these people failed Donna. They failed Tad. And we just get that same feeling over and over and over again. I mean, Sheriff Bannerman could have been saved as well. He's a, another holdover from the Dead Zone who, who meets his ending at, well, at the teeth of Cujo. It's pretty bad death. But he also helps bring the, the Frank Dodd subplot to what sort of conclusion it has. It's not really much. And really, it just serves, to, at least to me, to give Cujo that supernatural bent that really didn't feel all that necessary. Even though it sort of acted and helped explain Cujo's awful, terrible, supervillain-like instinct, which I, from what I understood, was Frank Dodd communicating to Cujo and telling him what to do. But most of these side plots, subplots, whatever you want to call them, including the Frank Dodd bit, but all of those ones that I mentioned earlier, they're not really that interesting. A lot of them actually come off as filler for what should be, what feels like it could be, a very great tale about a rabid dog. But I guess you kind of need those other ones to sort of set up how horrible of a situation the Donna and Tad have entered into in Cujo. I assume that's really what they're there for is just for that setup because you don't really get a lot of closure on the subplots toward the end of the book. They're sort of just kind of left by the wayside. They just kind of go away. It's pretty magical in a way. And we're left with what is undoubtedly the best part of the book, which is Donna versus Cujo. And perhaps the most, the, perhaps the reason this is, at least to me, the most fascinating part is because King uses his, his dog voice. The same voice that he used extensively, maybe not so extensively, in The Stand, when having the dog in there. So we're able to follow in sort of a, a first-person, maybe second-person narrative, 
Cujo's downfall from a so-called good dog. Cujo. His name's Cujo. Cujo? To this practically unstoppable killing machine. <laughs> and unlike those other subplots, side plots, whatever you want to talk about, Cujo's storyline is interesting right from the start, at least, you know, chronologically. And right from the start, you know, from the from the book itself. But chronologically, the first time we see Cujo is when Vic Donna and Tad go about a year before the main events of the story to have Vic's car looked at at the Cambers. And this is what King writes when Vic first lays eyes on Cujo. For one absurd moment, he wondered if it really was a dog, or maybe some strange and ugly species of pony. Then as the dog padded out of the shadows of the barn's mouth, he saw its sad eyes and realized it was a Saint Bernard. And despite the large size of the dog, he's... He's lovable. He's friendly. You just want to kind of go up and give him a hug. He actually, Tad runs around and he, he ends up falling over and Cujo runs up, grabs him by the back of his shirt and pulls him upright. He's such a great dog. You know, we're told time and again that he is a good dog and he remains this way until being the good outdoor dog that he is, Cujo chases a rabbit. He's chasing a rabbit, having fun chasing this rabbit, he's having a good old time doesn't even want to eat the rabbit, just wants to have fun chasing it. He chases it into a cave. A cave where a certain insectivorous brown bat is hanging out. One with, as we are told, a particularly nasty case of rabies. And that proceeds to scratch and claw a question mark shaped wound into Cujo's snout. And this right here, this Again, small event leads to what will inevitably be the end of the good dog, as we know, the dog that I just want to run up to and hug. And in one of the scenes, almost immediately after her, we already see that Cujo's disposition is changing. King wrote, He hadn't growled at the man because he was hot, but simply because he didn't feel good. For a moment there, just a moment, he had felt like biting the man. This quote here I found particularly interesting. When Cujo slept, he had dreams of uncommon, unpleasant vividity. In one of these, he had savaged the boy, had ripped his throat open, and then pulled his guts out of his body in streaming bundles. He had awakened from this dream twitching and whining, all of which led to this, this somber, subtle, sort of final adding of the good dog. Cujo looked at the boy, not recognizing him anymore, not his looks, not the shadings of his clothes, not his scent. What he saw was a monster on two legs, though he does recognize the boy Brett's voice, which goes on to save Brett in what turns out to be the very last moment of Cujo's real life. The last of the dog that had been before the bat scratched its nose turned away, and the sick and dangerous dog, subverted for the last time, was forced to turn with it. And it's into this situation that Donna and Tad stumble. So from pages about 153 in my book to about 303, so 150 pages, good chunk of this book, about half of the book, it's the main drive is Donna versus Cujo. Donna trying to keep her son alive while Cujo is constantly trying to kill him. But again, that drive, that main plot is occasionally interrupted by these other subplots that don't really go anywhere, don't really add anything to the story except help to explain why nobody is coming to help them. It kind of gets a little bit tedious. We'll ignore that for the rest of this. Because Donna's struggle for survival, Cujo's struggle to end her, to hunt her, to kill her and Tad. Donna's struggle to save Tad. It's incredible. It kept me on the edge of my seat. And then, of course, it got me so incredibly depressed because Tad doesn't make it at the end. And for those of you who don't know, Tad in this book is the same age as my son right now. And I can clearly see 
my son acting and doing exactly what Tad would do in this situation if he were ever thrust into this situation. Same with my wife. She would have done anything to save our son, to kill that dog, to get rid of the enemy. Of course, she would hope for other people to come and uh, help them first, just as Donna did in the book. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And that's not even to mention all the other connections I have in the book. They, they mention Stratford and Milford and Bridgeport a lot. I, of course, have connections to those. And there are a few other ones that I, I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna talk about because I don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole at just this moment. But back to that climactic death. Tad's climactic death. Apparently, and this, this is something that came as a bit of a surprise to me, his death came as a surprise to Stephen King. Shocking, right? Though I couldn't find the exact quote, Michael R. Collings, in an essay that he wrote about Cujo, included this little bit of information. He wrote, In terms of the accidental seeming death of Tad Trenton, King spoke about it shortly after the novel's publication. Tad Trenton, he commented in a conference guest of honor speech, was always supposed to survive. That was in King's head from the beginning. When he realized that Donna had finally managed to escape from the car, make her way into the camber kitchen, and put her son on the table, he also, and suddenly, realized that the boy was dead. Gut-wrenching. Heartbreaking. It was so hard to read that section. But the adaptation changed things up a bit. Had a different ending. A somewhat more optimistic ending. And I think right now we have to talk about that. The Lewis Teague directed adaptation, side note before we go any further that, this was supposed to be directed by Peter Medic, but he left just two days into filming. I don't know why, it's a little weird, but anyways, this film, it's a fairly faithful adaptation as far as adaptations go. Sure, the timeline is compressed a little bit, That the trip that Vic, Donna, and Tad took to the Cambers a year earlier is, is put into the present day, and a couple of the other things are switched around a little bit, and the subplots are generally just left away in the second half of the film, just just lopped off, much to my happiness. I, I thought that was a, a good direction to go and just kind of let those things be, right? I liked that. I did. But this film, yes, as I said, for the most part, very faithful. And to my surprise, that included the connection to the dead zone. Now, it's not as explored as it was in the novel, but it's still present, which I have to say made me a little disappointed to see that Sheriff Bannerman was not portrayed by the same actor. In Cujo, we have Sandy Ward, and over in the dead zone, they had Tom Skerritt, though they both bring a pretty solid performance as a character, bring their own little bit of nuances. Interestingly, both Cujo and The Dead Zone premiered in 1983. Cujo actually debuted first in the summer, which I guess technically makes The Dead Zone a prequel movie, right? But the major difference in Cujo's adaptation, Tad lives. Thank God Tad lives, because I think for the film, that is absolutely the right call, because Seeing Tad suffer, seeing him cry, hearing him cry in the car and beg for, for, for water, for food, to go home, to, to cry out for his daddy, to repeat the monster words. It is so much more visceral in the film than it is in the book. And when it comes to Tad's death, the book had portrayed it a bit in a bit of a cold manner, a bit of a detached manner. I think that was appropriate for the scene within the book. But we didn't have that here in the film. It was, you were right up in there. You you were witnessing it. You were feeling it. And if Tad had died, I don't think I could have walked away from Cujo thinking it was a good film. I think I would have thought it was the most depressing thing I've ever seen. And I don't think my wife would have ever forgiven me for asking her to watch it with me. But the other thing that I took away from Cujo was just pure awe. Why? Because of the way that the animals 
were handled. Right from the opening scene, when we see Cujo chasing after the rabbit, I couldn't help but wonder how this was all done. How was all of this captured? They even have POV shots from Cujo's perspective that sort of stand in in place of King's dog voice chapters. The direction that they, that they take it, the stuff that they make this dog do, it shocked me that they were able to handle it so well. Now, I, I should note, Cujo was not portrayed by one dog, as I thought, kind of going in, and I was like, is that the Beethoven dog? Is that the same dog? Well, it was actually portrayed by four different St. Bernard dogs, led by dog trainer Carl Lewis Miller, as well as several mechanical dogs, a Labrador Great Dane mix in a costume, and a stuntman also in a St. Bernard costume. How this wasn't nominated for its special effects work, I will never know nor understand. But if you would like to know more about it, there is actually a book, one published back in 2017. It goes by the title, Nope, Nothing Wrong Here, by film historian Lee Gambin. And of course, takes its title from the somewhat famous line from the book and the film. Nope, nothing wrong here. And it seems to offer an in-depth making of look that I think any film critic or fan would just love to give it a read. I know I'm going to give it a read. I haven't read it yet prior to recording this dissection, but I will. It just wasn't available at my library, and I just finished Cujo not too long ago. Now, Cujo, the adaptation, wasn't a huge success when it debuted. It made about $21 million in its domestic run, which is just slightly ahead of the Dead Zones, I should note. But this seemingly was enough to warrant greenlighting a reboot. One titled under the acronym Cujo. Yes, that is an acronym for, for what is it for? Canine Unit Joint Operations. We'll see how that one comes along, if it ever truly does. But enough of that adaptation. I want to bounce back to the book because there's something I did not talk about yet. Something, a big takeaway that we have to talk about. And that is particularly what this book, Cujo, is about. What is it about? Before we get to that, I want to talk our beer pairing for today. For Cujo, I wanted to go with something a little wild, a little different. Not just your everyday run-of-the-mill IPA or anything like that, not even your regular everyday wine, because I looked at everything for Cujo. I wanted something abnormal, something a little, a little rabid in its sense. And what I inevitably settled on was this beer from Victory Brewing, Wild Devil Brett IPA. It is a, a slightly sour IPA. You can smell it right off the nose. Oh, it just, it smells like a, a, a sweet tart. It smells delicious. It's got a beautiful color to it. Some active yeast because this is a bottle conditioned beer and you can age this however long you felt like it. But you taste this and the tartness there, it's not going to whack you over the face. This is a great beer. This is a great sort of introductory sour beer. That's what I would call it. It's your step between an IPA and a sour, and it is very well done. I think any of you out there would enjoy it. And to me, it is the perfect representation of what Cujo is. A great beer, the IPA, with something a little off about it, the sourness. Now, let's talk about what Cujo is actually all about, because I gotta say, it might be a little confusing to some. I mentioned addiction earlier, saying that is what Cujo is possibly, perhaps probably, about, which makes sense given the circumstances under which the novel was written. And it's easy to make this argument. Before Cujo's bitten, he's this sweet, lovable creature, one that everybody loves. This, this family pet who wouldn't hurt a soul. But after he's bitten, this changes dramatically to the point that Cujo's no longer in control. He's controlled by this, this rage, by this, this foreign instinct, this foreign element, even attacking the people that he supposedly loves. 
outlined like that, there is a striking similarity to The Shining, which directly dealt with alcohol addiction. And so, yes, it's certainly possible, again, probable that Cujo is about addiction. A, a, a very not-so-subtle metaphor lying beneath the somewhat simple storyline of a rabid dog. But Keelan Patrick Burke, in an essay for StephenKingRevisited.com, gave a different interpretation. Supposing that Cujo is, and I quote, a harrowing and bleak exploration of marital dissolution and the consequences of infidelity. The titular antagonist represents more than just a dog made homicidal by rabies. He is also a metaphor for the doom that descends on marriage when the love begins to wither, when deception comes easier than confession, when children begin to feel the death of truth and love among the only people they trust. Again, that is another possibility, one supported by seemingly ample evidence, as was the former. There's evidence to back both of those theories up. But there's evidence to back probably limitless theories here. I will give you another one. Stephen Kemp. Steve Kemp, as he's mostly referred to, with whom Donna has the affair. He is basically a human version of Cujo. He is rabid. He's controlled by his anger. He suffers from the same exact maladies, from the rage, from everything. And Stephen Kemp, Steve Kemp, doesn't that sound rather familiar? Doesn't sound all that different from Stephen King, does it? Same letters, same same initials there. Is Steve Kemp meant to be something of a stand-in for Stephen King? Was this him guessing what his life would have been like were it not for his wife Tabitha if he had not found the success that he had in his novels? Going even deeper into the metaphors and whatnot, is the bat that bit Cujo a stand-in for Salem's Lot, the book that really put King on the map following his debut novel Carrie? Is Cujo the actual stand-in for King? That's one way to look at it, but there's even more interpretations we can go to. Cujo's name, for instance. Why the Willy wolf Patty Hearst connection? Is there, is there more at play there within the novel than we even suspect? Patty Hearst was kidnapped, just as Donna was kidnapped, or at least thought to have been kidnapped. Patty Hearst was failed, just as Donna was failed. I think it's possible that King's mind might have gone in that direction while he was writing. Then again, perhaps this is all some sort of allegorical tale about how we failed to prevent the Vietnam War. As mentioned in previous dissections, Vietnam seems to always be on the forefront of King's mind. Or, Cujo could just be a simple tale of a rabid dog. Unfortunately, while we can try to gleam any answer out of it, any meaning whatsoever, right now, and probably forever, we will never get an answer because of that cocaine binge. Stephen King doesn't remember writing this, so his actual reasoning, his actual metaphor, if there was a metaphor that he was driving at within Cujo, is lost. We can never know for sure what he was thinking while writing this book. Was it a metaphor for addiction? Was it a metaphor for Vietnam, for Patty Hearst, for, for whatever? What was the reasoning behind this book? Was it just a straightforward tale? Probably not. But in the end, Cujo is what it is. And you and I have to take away from it what we can, what we do. And we have to be content with that. This has been Drunk on Writing's dissection of Stephen King's Cujo. Next up, the Richard Bachman novel, The Running Man. And it's interesting adaptation starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Remember, if you liked this video, please be sure to leave a comment below, please give it a thumbs up, please subscribe to the channel, and if you're feeling really randy, head on over to drunkonwriting.com and sign up to become part of the show to get exclusive videos, to get exclusive access, early access, to every video published. 
and I hope I see you over there. Until next time, cheers. Keep on riding.